but by that. The, the ultra wealthy focuses on the invisible stuff, the intangible stuff. And that meaning uh, their mental capital, their relationship capital, you know, all the, the core, their core beliefs, their worldview, their philosophy, um, what they stand for, their principles. They've got an infrastructure for decision making. You know, and that mental capital is transferred along with financial capital to the next generation. That's why you see certain families, you know, certain families have money. I mean, how many generations does the Rockefellers have right now, right? Mm -hmm. um, and some families like that, like the Rothschilds. It's not because they just pass on money to the next generation. We've seen that before. We know how that story ends. Exactly. It ends in a lot of speedboats and jets and you know, a lot of big houses and parties, and then it's gone after a while. Welcome to the Wealth Through Real Estate Investing Podcast, your source for real world strategies focused on creating long term wealth, cash flow, and financial freedom through real estate. Through guidance, tips, and stories of highly successful real estate investors and thought leaders, we provide you the tools to succeed and reach the lifestyle you always wanted. And now, your host, Dwayne Clark. Hello and welcome to the Wealth Through Real Estate Investing Podcast. This is your host, Dwayne Clark. Today, we have a very special guest, MC Lobster from Pennsylvania, joining us today. MC is a wealth strategist, educator, and financial freedom fighter. He is the president of Producers Wealth and the host of the top-rated podcast, Listen All Over the Country and the World, uh, cash flow ninja uh, welcome mc and thank you for joining the show yeah thank you so much for having me on appreciate uh, you having me on and always uh, great to connect absolutely yeah we've been uh, following you for quite a while like i said that uh, your we talked pre-show about your podcast being in like over 180 countries and you're kind of well renowned uh, can you kind of tell us like your journey uh, kind of starting out and how you became ultimately the cash flow ninja yeah so i'm originally from uh from south africa i came to the u.s in 2001 um growing up in south africa was uh, especially during uh, the time that i grew up uh there was extremely interesting obviously there was a lot of changes going on and it definitely shaped the person that i am today i question everything i research everything you know i read as wide and study as wide as i can and then i form my own opinion um in the US, I came in, in 2001, and one of the things that really struck me big time um, was the upward mobility that the US allowed. Because I traveled quite a bit to other countries too, and the US is just something special in that, in that regard where, you know, anyone, regardless of where you're from, your background, the language that you speak, the color of your skin, your hair, anything, you can do and be whatever you want. You've got folks, um, so many people, successful people coming from basically nowhere and for a start with nothing and create uh, amazing lives for themselves and their families and generations to come. So that's one of the things that struck me. Fast forward now 20 years, I feel with technology, it's now not just the US, right? It's the entire world. You have access to the internet and can connect to the internet. Now, all of a sudden, the playing field is leveled. So, um, yeah, my, uh, about myself, I mean, I, I, I came across Rich Dad, Poor Dad, the book in 2000, and I think it was 2000. My mom actually gave me the book. It was released in 97. I read it in 2000. I played sports. That's one of the reasons why I ended up in the States. Mm. And as I was traveling quite a bit, I played in this uh, national rugby league and played representative rugby. I just studied and, and Rich Dad Poor Dad is kind of where my journey started. It took me down the rabbit hole um, because what the book really essentially did for me, as it did for many folks, is it expanded my, um, my context and how I viewed the world, right? And then all of a sudden, it inspires you to study in other areas. Well, how does the monetary system work? Mm -hmm. How does this work? You know, how is the game of money played? What's the blueprint that the rich use to not only create um, and build their wealth, but also keep their wealth for generations? So you study all of that, those types of things, um, and then you just keep on studying. And so, and I took action and, and while, as I was studying, right? So you study about real estate. I buy my first property a couple months later, um, stumbled stumbled across a mentor. I wasn't looking for him. I didn't know I was supposed to. 
Um, and it was a massive impact in my life uh, from, a, from a real estate and a wealth standpoint that really expedited my, my growth. Um, but yeah, fast forward to where I am right now. I've got a wealth creation firm. We don't manage any money. It's called Producers Wealth. We service clients in all 50 states in the U.S. and also in Canada. We help them uh, create, protect, and multiply their wealth in any economy um, and any market. And then, as you alluded to, um, the show Cashflow Ninja started as a passion project of mine, mm. um, just researching the ways that you can generate cash flow and income from different asset classes. So we cover real estate businesses, especially e-commerce. We cover commodities, we cover paper assets, and also we covered crypto and blockchain technologies uh, pretty early on from the, from the beginning of the show uh, about three years ago. So cash flow is the philosophy that uh, I think I found through all of my research and study, um, which, um, which allows a lot of certainty, it allows predictability, there's an immediate f uh, feedback mechanism, and that's true wealth. Because with cash flow, you actually can buy your time back, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the definitions in the book of true wealth that Kiyosaki talked about in Rich Dad Poor Dad was if you stopped working today, how long can you sustain your current uh, standard of living? Mm -hmm. And a lot of folks might have this massive net worth on paper, but actually, if you look at the numbers, they would be out of money, you know, in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So that's not true wealth. So wealth is you uh, focus your energy, you build and create assets that feeds you for the rest of your life. And then also long after we're gone and in the ground and the worms have had their way with us, it feeds our families and mm -hmm. our children's children. So that's kind of where that kind of um, show kind of w w the direction that it took. And um, yeah, we, we had a lot of folks that, uh, that, that found the message and that resonated with us. Yeah, that, that's very cool. Uh, like a lot of your, your background story, as I've been kind of learning more about you, kind of resonated with me. I'm also a, an athlete as well. And also found rich dad, poor dad, and kind of started questioning things and saying, you know, you know, why is this that? And then looking at the people who are successful in the country, you know, what are they doing? They're obviously doing something right if they're, you know, that successful and sustaining long-term uh, wealth and you know, and for generations to come. Um, it's kind of speaking with your mentor because mentors was a big thing to me um, coming up, uh, either through mentor through books or physical mentors. Uh, kind of that transition, you obviously learn a lot uh, working with your mentor. Um, can you kind of just elaborate a little bit more about that kind of specific skills that you learned and kind of the importance of having a mentor? Absolutely. So from a sporting background, too, we understand the importance of coaches, right? Yeah. Um, so, you know, Tiger Woods is to talk about Tiger because yeah. he's one of the masters. What an unbelievable story that is. Mm -hmm. But Tiger, Michael Jordan, all these folks, all these top, top athletes, Tom Brady, Michael Phelps, they all have coaches that support them. So, and in different areas, right? So they've got a nutritional guy, they've got a strength and conditioning guy, and then they've got more sports specific stuff. You know, Tiger's got a swing coach and so forth. So I think a, a, coming from an athletic background, I knew the power of having a good coach and what a good coach can do for you mentally and also physically, you know, helping you and training and, and that kind of stuff. So translate that to money and to wealth and to especially real estate, you know, coaches and mentors played the same role in my development in my life. And the same as, and, and as athletics, right? You start young and you have your coaches from peewee league, you know, and, and get you through high school and you change coaches and mentors, the same thing happened in my journey where you start with one that teaches you the basic stuff and grows. And then as you develop and grow and you, you know, your career goes into different directions, you found different coaches and different mentors and you bring in different team members. The same tax guy that I started with 20 years ago is not the same guy that's going to be able to help me today. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a, it, you, you need to uh, continually elevate your game and find folks that get you there. I mean, just think of all the different coaches back to Tiger that Tiger had in his lifetime, right? Um, and all of the, 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 the people that's been part of his support staff and his team and so forth. So 
you 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 usually upgrade uh, upgrade those as you go up in levels because you know the same skill set that that uh, what's the uh, what's the saying something to the and I butcher a lot of quotes by the way <laughs> same with me. but it's something about the same skills that got you certain one place is not going to get you you know to the promised land basically right mm -hmm. so um, they got what, what it's the biblical quote of the same the the skills that got you out of Canaan is not going to get you to the promised land, something to that effect. But anyway, it's the same thing with wealth where certain skills are going to get you to a certain level. Then you're going to have to upgrade or find new skills and new mentors, you know, from a business perspective and real estate is a business. If you grow your business and I'm just going to use numbers for, you know, businesses, but the skill set that takes you from zero to a million is different from one to 10 and it's different from 10 to a hundred. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and that's a learning process. So you've got to, the focus needs to be on the process and enjoy that instead of just continually chasing something to try and get, to try and get to, 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 to a certain spot. Absolutely. <clears throat> kind of before what you kind of alluded to in regards to the, the really successful and how they build wealth, especially generational wealth and the importance of that, uh, kind of what are your your strategy or your philosophy on building wealth and and financial freedom and kind of if you can just elaborate on that your your philosophy absolutely so the biggest difference between um well i wouldn't even say the biggest difference between everyone else and then the the one percent you know whatever you want to call them the folks that have figured out how to not only build wealth but build generational wealth indestructible wealth is not necessarily that they do different things they do the complete opposite the complete opposite it's almost like that seinfeld episode where the opposite where george you know figures out that his entire life is the opposite of everything that it should have been <laughs> because he made the wrong decisions right so he yeah. walks up to this beautiful lady in the in the episode and says hi my name is george i'm unemployed and live with my parents but anyway um <laughs> the opposite is what they do so what do i what do i mean by that the majority of the people focus on stuff you know stuff uh, do i buy real estate do i buy this do i buy that the, the ultra wealthy focuses on the invisible stuff, the intangible stuff. And that meaning uh, their mental capital, mm -hmm. their relationship capital, you know, all the, the core, their core beliefs, their worldview, their philosophy, um, what they stand for, their principles. They've got an infrastructure for decision making, you know, and that mental capital is transferred along with financial capital to the next generation. That's why you see certain families you know, certain families have money. I mean, how many generations does the Rockefellers have right now, right? Mm -hmm. um, and some families like that, like the Rothschilds. It's not because they just pass on money to the next generation. We've seen that before. We know how that story ends. Exactly. It ends in a lot of speedboats and jets and, you know, a lot of big houses and parties, and then it's gone after yeah. a while. They do. They focus on strategy where, you know, they build a solid strategy around their core values, their principles, around their mental capital, their relationship capital, around their unique ability, their strengths. They bring in the team and then right at the end, they integrate certain asset classes, right? We do a lot with real estate, for example, and insurance and integrate those. So it's a combined strategy. You know, back to the Tiger example, sticking on the masters, Tiger Woods does not get a coach to help him pick out golf clubs. Mm -hmm. Tiger Woods brings in a coach to help him with his swing, his overall game, his short game, or his putting stroke, or his swing, as apart from his strategy. They do not come in and help him pick out drivers. So, but that's what, I mean, and, and most people will listen to me saying this and say, duh, you, you know, that's just common sense. But when we translate that over to financial and wealth building stuff, that's what we do. We try to pick clubs. Yeah. You know, there's a club for every situation on the course, but they all fit into a bag. Mm -hmm. It's a strategy that we have, the game plan that we have, and how to, to utilize all of these different clubs and tools that we have. Uh, the same with advisors. So that's some of the stuff that I've seen. Um, you know, and like at the core of this is this principle that you are your number one and greatest asset period you are the creator and producer of all wealth in your life you know uh kiyosaki back to rich dad poor dad talks about 
uh, the risk is not in the investment, but in the investor. Mm -hmm. meaning it always comes back to you and everyone, everyone else wants something outside of themselves, right? That lucky, that golden ticket from Charlie in the chocolate factory or that Bitcoin that they buy for 20 cents and now it's a million dollars, but it it never goes away from you. So you're the, you're your number one and greatest asset. The rich, the wealthy knows this. Warren Buffett knows this, you know, uh, Bill Gates knows this, Steve, J- all these guys, you throw in the names, they know it. Um, then th- secondary to that is not only you, you as an asset, but your asset as your network, your relationships. And then your biggest investment is around is in your business, whether it be a real estate business in your business. Um, because it's around your investor DNA, number one. It's around build a, that. That's around your strengths. You've built your business or your investment strategy mm-hmm. around your strengths, what you know best, and your unique ability. So you've got those three things right there. Now you see why people lose all, everything. Mm-hmm. You know, if you if you take a guy like Mark Cuban and you take everything away from him and he loses everything. Um, he's probably going to build up everything quicker than he's ever done. Exactly. Like in the next couple of years, he'll he'll be bigger and, and, and more wealthier and have generated more wealth than he had before mm-hmm. because he focused on himself and his relationship. So you could take the money away. Those two things right there are bigger assets, right? So, and then from a strategic point, um, within that, tactically, they all have cash generators, a cash machine, whether it be businesses that they have, right? And then they warehouse it somewhere and then they deploy it and, 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 and put it into certain hard assets like real estate that keeps uh, generating cash flow for generations and outlive them. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's, they keep it very simple too. Here's another thing that I've learned. You know, uh, we overcomplicate things so much. You know, we we think we need to sit down with an advisor with this elaborate plan and statistics and this and numbers and charts and all these things. It's very simple. You have to make your money somewhere. You have to protect it. And then you have to multiply. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The thing that was very key that you were saying is kind of like that investing in your to yourself. You mentioned, you know, Mark Cuban, if he lost everything today. And that's the same with all these other very successful investors. I always hear that same scenario. It's like, if I lost all of my money today, I'll, I'll make it all back in 12 months where people, they'll just be, they'll be totally wiped out. Right. They kind of, they got the money, like you, you say, in some scenarios where it was passed on from previous generation, where they'll just buy boats and this, this and that, and they always think that the money's coming in, but they don't have that, that mental capacity or that, you know, that mindset to be able to recreate it or, you know, further that stuff. So I think that's definitely key. And that's, probably the, the most important part because none of this stuff really is irrelevant because you won't be able to sustain it or, you know, create it from scratch. If you, you know, you started from the beginning. So that's yep. definitely key. Yeah. And that's the wealth mo- a formula mentor taught me. And this might be a great exercise for your listeners and your viewers. Um, the wealth formula is those two things, mental capital times your relationship capital. So you can always take inventory of those two things, write them down. Where are you at right now? Mentally? What do you know? What are your skill set? What are your experiences? Um, what are you reading? What are you studying? All those type of things. Relationships. Who do you know? Who's part of your team? Who's part of your network? You can write down all those things. What masterminds you belong to? What meetup groups you go to? And then you, it's all on paper. You look at where you're at and then you look at your goals. Well, what do I need to increase in these two areas to get there? People are so focused on the financial capital. That's the third piece of that equation. It's your mental capital times your relationship equals financial. Most people are so obsessed with the financial. If you take care of the mental and the relationship, the financial will take care of itself. It, it just will. I mean, that's just, you know, it, it, this is how the universe works. Um, so I think that's that's what I would I would say to your your viewers and your listeners be very focused on those two areas Mm -hmm. um, and also continually take inventory of it and and set goals in those areas too. Mm, Absolutely. Just kind of touching a little bit on the strategy point, you kind of touched a little bit about it. I know you're a big follower of like Robert Kiyosaki's uh, philosophies and he talks about that, those four quadrants. And uh, I have a lot of conversations with uh, my, you know, my investors regarding it because they're in the, the left side of the quadrant where they're, you know, they make a lot of income. 
Yes. Uh, now they're trying to transition it over to the investor, you know, business income size, particularly the investor side, because yep. they're trying to reduce those taxes on the um, the employee, the, the high income earner side over to the passive income side, which is lower taxes. Can you kind of elaborate on that strategy a bit and kind of how can people, um, there's some ways for them to transition over to that right side of the quadrant. Absolutely. I love the quadrant. I think that's one of his best concepts, Kiyosaki's concepts. I think that concept alone right there is going to, I mean, that's going to live on for a long time mm -hmm. because it's such a great way of explaining the world and the people that operate within the marketplace. Leading into that, here's what I'm going to say. And this is what you're, if there's one thing I can, I want your listeners and your viewers to take with them today is your biggest threat to your wealth right now is taxes. It is, I mean, it is the biggest wealth destroyer. We all know that that's kind of common sense, but where we are in the world right now, regardless of what country you live in, if you do not include a tax strategy along and incorporate that in your overall strategy, you are going to run into a massive storm in the coming years. We've already started seeing it unfold. Um, it's, I'm not Nostradamus. I'm not a prognosticator. Um, but it's just, it, you just see this trend um, starting. It's accelerating. You know, I'm in Pennsylvania. We've already seen with New Jersey, what is it now like? They call it a rain tax. I mean, they've got some fancy political way to, to, to mm -hmm. spin it. But essentially, you're going to see more idiotic stuff like that because they're going to try and figure out how to get more taxes. So if you own a house, for example, property taxes, you know, you're a sitting duck. Qualified retirement plans, you're a sitting duck. All these other different pockets, you're, you're being set up is what I'm trying to say. So the cash flow quadrant teaches you the different types of people in the marketplace, but it also teaches you how to play the game from a tax point. Mm -hmm. um, and regardless of who's in office, because I hear a lot of people say, well, you know, if the Republicans are in office, this or the Democrats, it, it doesn't matter. Exactly. The tax code is just a blueprint. It's just a game. You just have to figure it out and play it to your advantages. And the way that you do well in the game is you have a very good tax advisor mm -hmm. and a very good tax strategist. That way you'll smile every April 15th, like I just did, you know, with a lot of other folks and you embrace tax day. You can't wait for it because, mm -hmm. you know, you, that's your scorecard. You know, I look at, I look at my taxes and I go, oh shoot, I got to provide more value for folks. I got to grow my business and I got to provide more affordable housing through real estate. Mm -hmm. That'll get me to pay less taxes. Yeah. That's the, that's the game. Exactly. Producers and creators are rewarded and they're on the right side of that quadrant. So you have the E and the S on the left hand side, the employee and the self employed. You have the B and the I on the right hand side. Mm -hmm. It's two different worlds. It's, it's, it's different philosophies. It's a different way to see it. And from a tax, a tax standpoint, it's a completely different world. So the highest tax obviously is the employee. They're working for money. This is where the majority of people find themselves on the left hand side. Self employed too. You know, some folks take the step, take the leap, and now they're an S. Now they're working very, very hard. Um, but they're also still getting hit with a lot of taxes, right? Mm -hmm. And by the way, this is a progression. I went through these, this exact same progression. Mm -hmm. So starting as an E, going into an S. On the right hand side, is where things start to happen. If you've ever played the, the board game Cash Flow 2 that Kiyosaki created. Mm -hmm. The board game, yeah. Um, yeah, this is now you're, you're stepping onto the fast track on that right hand side of the quadrant. Being a business owner, owning a system, and being an investor, investing in a business or investing in someone else's system. So those two things, and that's why I say the producers and the, and the creators are on the right-hand side, and that's why they get all the tax benefits and pay the, less, uh, the least taxes, because a business exists for two reasons, and two reasons only, to solve a problem or create an outcome a yeah. desirable outcome for someone. So there's value creation. Investments and investors um, inv put their capital, risk their capital into certain areas to provide certain things that other people need. 
real mm-hmm. estate, affordable housing, whether, you know, if it's commercial and there's a strip mall, you know, business owners need a place to, to operate and they provide that. Right. So um, I would just say from that perspective is study that, know the different types of quadrants, know where you are at right now and try to figure out a plan to get over to the right hand side. And there's different strategies of how to do that, but it's very, very important, especially from a tax standpoint, because that is the biggest threat to your wealth mm-hmm. uh, and it's coming. That okay. big, that light at the end, uh, end of the tunnel is a tax train. Yeah. Headed our way. And if you don't have a plan for it, you will get crushed. And there's just no way around it. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the biggest thing you said, uh, as far as getting on that side is, is real estate. Um, yes. that's what we mainly focus on. Um, as far as uh, the real estate strategy, there's a lot of different asset, asset classes you can invest in. We like, you know, net lease and apartments and stuff like that. Um, there's other ones that as well. Um, one thing that I like that you say is, is regarding to diversification and kind of um, seeing where the market is and kind of adjusting your strategy. Can you kind of elaborate on the types of assets that you can recommend based off of the, the cycle of the market? Yeah, so right now, um the market cycle is, is, you know, markets go up, down and sideways. There's different strategies for each market. Uh, you need to have a strategy that works in every single scenario. Um, right now we're very, very frothy. Um, we're right at the top in a lot of asset cycles. Um, you know, stocks, we, we know where that is. Real estate also very, very frothy. Um, then there's, I mean, there's, there are some assets that's, that's not, not necessarily, very desirable right now. Mm. Uh, gold companies, gold, silver, a lot of the, the commodities are right at the bottom of their asset cycle, right? Mm-hmm. So every asset just goes goes in different cycles. So um, yeah, I mean, what do people invest in in recessions? Uh, mobile home park, cell storage. Uh, here's a trend that we see that ties into this baby boomer trend of 70, what is it, 70 million plus baby boomers. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, is assisted living facilities is a big one. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, um, yeah, there, there's, there, there's a ton of opportunities still, uh, even with multifamily and other places being, uh, being a little overheated. Mm. Yeah. The thing that we had talked about pre-call that I would uh, love for you to kind of elaborate on is your, your infinite banking uh, strategy. Could you kind of inform our guests, you know, what it is and you know, what, you know, what that involves? Yeah, absolutely. So there's three things that I listed that the that the wealthy do. They make their money through their cash machine. Uh, then they park their money somewhere, and then they use it to invest back into their own businesses or back in investments. You know, investors and and investors and entrepreneurs and business owners are not like everyone else. They know they're not like everyone else. They've, they've always been different, right? Mm-hmm. You know, um, even if, even if you're, you were young, you always wanted different things. You've always wanted that bigger future and build on a bigger future. The majority of the advice is tailored towards everyone else and not towards investors and entrepreneurs. So what the infinite banking does and there's different ways how to use it, but it's a great way to position cash and, and build a cash flow management system for investors and business owners. Mm. So it's actually um, it's actually an insurance vehicle. It's it's a dividend paying all life insurance policy, which is I guess a four letter word in a lot of conversations. Um, and I'm just going to refer back to strategy versus product. You know, real estate insurance. It's all just it's all just vehicles. Um, there's people that lose a ton of money in real estate and then the same per that different person buys that piece of real estate and now he's just knocking it out of the park and it's a cash flow cow. How is that possible? Well, it's a strategy. Whole life insurance is the same thing. The way that whole life is sold and packaged to the majority of the public, it's a horrible place to park cash. Mm-hmm. Um, it is what Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman will call it in, in a lot of ways, right? The way that it's structured in family offices and with, um, yeah, with, with these very high net worth families and, and also individuals and, and how we use it, is it structured for max cash value, not just for the, the, the death insurance, but also for the living benefits of the life insurance, quote unquote. So the reason why we do it is um, 
and utilize this vehicle is because of the guarantees that's in there, guarantees on cash value, guarantees on the growth. Um, as a policyholder in a mutual insurance company, you get to participate in the profitability through dividends. These companies have been around since the mid 1800s. They've paid dividends throughout, uh, throughout time. Um, a lot of them have paid, the one company has paid a dividend consecutively since 1847. It's wow. kind of ridiculous. They got a pretty good track record. <laughs> yeah, they have a uh, very large cash positions. These companies are not listed on the stock exchanges. So this is not AIG, you know, where a lot of people say, oh, insurance, oh, like AIG. No, yeah, yeah. no, no, this is not AIG. AIG is a stock company. So they're part of the Wall Street casino. So this is outside of that. But the growth inside of these policies are tax free, meaning we pay taxes on the seed, not the harvest. And this is plays into an overall tax strategy. I pay my taxes now when I can control it and I know what it is. And then I put it in these vehicles and our clients and, and folks put it in these vehicles because we don't know what it's going to be in 20 or 30 years, right? Mm -hmm. So let's just eliminate that, um, yeah, that variable. But anyway, the other thing that, that this allows us to do is you can access your money at any time to use in your own business and to use in, in, in investments. Mm. So um, yeah, you can access that through a policy loan. Um, and basically how you access it, and this is the example I, I tell people in the 70s, we had very high interest rates in the 70s and the 80s in the US. So people would actually go to a bank and put their money in a CD mm. and get double digits. Well, let's just use 100,000. Let's just say you put 100,000 in a CD in a bank. And then you go back to that same bank and say, Mr. Banker, I've got 100,000 in your bank. Can I get a loan secured by that 100,000? And the banker said, of course, I've got your 100, I'll give you 90. That's what you're doing with your life insurance policy. So we fund these policies, the cash values, we build them up. Then we take a policy loan secured by the cash value and also your death benefit, great business model. They are covered both ways, right? Mm -hmm. Two ways. And we get to leverage that money to invest in our own businesses and to invest in assets. And then the cash flow from the business and from the real estate is just put back, we pay the policy loans back down and the money becomes available again. So why is it called, you know, it's an, it's an infinite system that you set up because you've got your businesses that generate cash in your investments. You take the cash, you put it in these policies. That's where you warehouse your wealth. Mm. It's part of your cash flow management system. You leverage it, you put it back in your business and the investments. The cash flow from that is then used to pay down your policy loans. Money becomes available again and rinse repeat. You just do it over and over and over wow. and it's constantly churning and going. So um, what I love about this is, and this is a little bit of a mindset shift for people too, is you don't have to choose whether you save or invest or use it in your business. You can do both. You could save your money and invest it at the same time. It's called, called quote unquote an end asset. Um, and then of course, I didn't even touch on the estate planning stuff of how you can tie this all together to transfer wealth efficiently because the death benefit goes tax free. These are also private accounts. Um, you know, so there's a lot of different benefits and why this is, this is utilized. So just playing it by the game. But um, I, I, would, I would just emphasize that, that this is a strategy I just shared. You know, this is a club full of ba a, a bag full of clubs rather that we're using with a strategy on the course to play the golf game. Mm -hmm. This isn't a single magical bullet. Um, insurance is not a get rich quick scheme. It's not an investment. It's a savings vehicle, quote unquote. Um, and it just, it, it's a piece. It's a moving piece of what we're trying to do here. <clears throat> that That is very interesting. Uh, Cause I was kind of, kind of getting into that question, but you actually, Kind of answer as far as the saving piece because how depending on where the market if you see it's coming to be a downturn you want to have like a stronger cash position to put into you know you know say fire sales or you know those opportunities that's going to arrive from the turning of the market but instead of putting it into the bank where you're going to have to pay taxes on you and you put into this insurance vehicle that has those tax benefits then when you're ready to strike and actually can tap into them to utilize and then you're kind of, you know, that's just a, a creative way of, of doing it. And yeah, not a lot of people are talking about that. And that's, uh, that's the key thing is because, you know, you mentioned the, the tax benefits there 
and all the yep. other benefits of the guarantees from the insurance company. And then it's just kind of like this not well-known kind of, uh, you know, vehicle that you can use that people should be doing in order to kind of maximize your wealth. Yeah. So we teach, there's four levels of financial <clears throat> success and the, and people talk about financial freedom, financial freedom, financial freedom. The first level is financial security. So even when you put your money in this vehicle, you know what you're going to have in 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now, because mm. it's contractually guaranteed. You've turned it into contractual guarantees um, instead of just hope. I, ho I, put, I have my money in a 401k. I hope the tax rates are the same. I hope the markets are at all time highs when I try to withdraw the money. Hope, 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 all of this stuff. Turn it into solid guarantees, pay taxes right now, uh, not in the future. That's been eliminated. I kind of know what I'm going to have available. I know the death benefit that's going to be there and I can access my money a long way. Mm. It gives me certainty. It gives me predictability. It gives me security. We don't have any money in the market. So I don't care what happens in the stock markets, right? So if the markets crash, like in 2008, nothing happens in these contracts. They still plug along, mm -hmm. still pay dividends. Most companies maintain their dividends. Um, you're going to get about a four to 5% internal rate of return. Uh, dividends are between six and seven, but it's like, you're going to get four to five because it's an insurance product, right? Mm -hmm. Because there are some insurance costs in there. Um, and it's, it's just a great place to warehouse cash to give your listeners and viewers, uh, um, an example, if you put a hundred grand in there, depending on your age, your, your, your gender, uh, your health rating, all that kind of stuff. So I don't want to paint this with one brush and one stroke, but you're probably going to have between 70 and 80,000 available in cash value in year one mm. already just by putting in a hundred, right? So every year wow. you add a little bit more five years. Now you've got over, you've put in 500,000, you've got over 500,000 in there, you know, and then 10 years time you put in a million, there's, there's way over a million in there tax free and it just keeps on growing. It's snowballs. So not get rich quick, very big picture, long-term range view, thinking of two to three generations uh, uh, ahead and also looking at uh, the big picture. Because if you're just interested in short term or short big hits or buying a Bitcoin that turns into a million bucks, this, this isn't for you. Mm -hmm. This is a very, very, uh, um, how can I say, diligent, disciplined way uh, that, that you can consistently put away savings in a, in a, in a warehouse and in a, in a place that, that, um, has got an impeccable track record and then use it in your own business, which we have a lot of business owners that we work with. Their best investment ever is their business. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it don't even get me. So I do not know how business owners are complete ninjas, make all this money in their business and then they turn it over and give it to financial advisors to help them invest in other people's business that they know nothing about, yeah. right? They should be investing that money in their back into their own business. So this is one way of warehousing your wealth, um, warehousing your cash, and then put it back in there. And from an investment standpoint, you make a great point. Right now is a great place to, to warehouse cash and build up a cash position. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of folks in our network that are using these policies to build up cash anticipating and waiting for the next downturn. Yeah, absolutely. And even what you had mentioned, four to five percent return is is pretty conservative, but you know, it's you know, it's pretty good still. So I mean yep. it's if you had the choice, you know, put into a CD or you know temporarily compared to this product, you you will go to this anytime because you're still gonna get a you know pretty conservative return for idle cash. Yep, absolutely. And sometimes as Warren Buffett says doing nothing is doing something. Exactly. You know, if your money was sitting in a bank, it's going to burn a hole in your pocket because you're earning 0 0.01 or two or whatever ridiculous amount you're earning. And it's at risk because it's in the bank. So you all, almost feel like you have to move it somewhere. So you're starting to make, you're starting to make the decisions of uh, financial decisions that are, that are not good. Uh, that's rushed and emotionally driven. Um, where with this kind of stuff, you know, if we take a policy loan, we know it's 5%. So, I know I'm getting four to five percent internal rate of return. I'm going to borrow probably at five, you know, at five percent Moody's corporate bond average yield. So I know that's my cost of capital. So I know that I need to have a good, solid investment to deploy that capital into. 
-hmm. And if I don't, I just let it sit there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So for the, our listeners that are not kind of familiar of how they get into these type of products, like how do you kind of access these and you know, where do you find them? Yeah, so we have more information. We actually, um, a part of Producers Wealth, what we do is we broker these. So we set this up for folks. Um, but I'm big on education because I don't want anyone to do anything that they don't understand or that they're not knowledgeable, knowledgeable about. So there's a free webinar and a course that I have at yourownbankingsystem.com. It's yourownbankingsystem.com that they can check out. And there's a link on there to set up a call with with us uh, if they're interested in exploring this strategy for themselves and how they could use this uh, to like put a little bit of extra juice in their, in their real estate investing. Absolutely. Um, so just kind of kicking back a little bit to the real estate side, because when we go from the infinite banking system strategy, where you can kind of place some capital into to real estate, what are you looking for as far as uh, market indicators and what type of markets um, are you looking at or recommend uh, that are kind of solid and continuously growing? I know in different parts from the, the coasts, you know, the, the Connecticut's, the, the New Jersey's, the California's of the world, people are kind of looking yeah. kind of place their capital into some hard assets. What are some markets you can look for and then what are some of the indicators that are, that are important? Right now, we have one of the biggest mass migrations happening in the United States. And most people are not aware of it because Fox, CNN, MSNBC, all these pl places are not going to tell you this. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually a website called How Money Walks, Travis Brown's website, really good information of what's happening in this country because states like California, New Jersey, New York, um, people are, Illinois, they're just fleeing basically out of that states. Where are they going to? Well, they're going to Texas, which is just exploding. They're going to Arizona and the baby boomers are moving to Florida, right? That nice weather for the retirement. So those are like some of the areas that, that, that folks are moving to. But as far as markets, jobs, 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 and where people are migrating to. Um, so we, we look at that and also a diversified job uh, market not just one industry, right? Because we saw what happened with NAFTA, especially in all these Rust Belt states, mm. um, when uh, a lot of big corporations moved out. These towns were destroyed. These cities were destroyed. So you got to look at very diverse uh, uh, job and companies in there. You know, and as far as deals, we look at the project. We look at trends. You know, I mentioned assisted living facilities is one of them. That plays into a trend. You could find a market where folks are moving to, whether it be Texas or Florida. Um, as far as that, Arizona is another one where a lot of folks are moving to, uh, for, for retirement. Um, and then besides the project, we look at partners who's involved, you know, we look at the team, we look at the management, who's managing this, you know, the, and then we look at the, we look at financing of how deals are financed and structured and so forth, and then cash flow, and then where the cash flow fits into the quadrant when we look at deals, right? Mm -hmm. Is it an equity deal, which it's going to get us on the right hand side? Is it a debt deal, which still kind of keeps us on the left hand side of it? Um, you know, so we we're we're cognizant of a lot of things when we look at it, but jobs, jobs, jobs. You want to go where people are going to and where they're moving to. And you also want to have a lot of different industries. You know, here's a market that not a lot of people are talking about, which um, has been on our radar for a while is Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of companies moving in there and different type of companies, even some tech companies, really, to be mm -hmm. honest. <laughs> There's a lot of different companies moving in there. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, you just have to, you just have to look at where, where the money Money's walking to because it's always walking. It's always moving. Exactly. <clears throat> as far as the different assets, uh, you know, we you know, focus on like net lease, retail and uh, the apartments, but the other assets, you know, such as like mobile home parks. And is there any other ones that you would recommend looking at? And it, and it differs, you know, kind of depending on your cycle to kind of hedge your, your, your risk per se. Yeah, I think those are like the big ones that, that come to mind. Um, you know, that kind of plays into this. You could have certain, uh, I mean, you got to look at what, uh, where millennials are moving to as well. There's deals in that. You got to look at um, the uh, buying behaviors of, of boomers, right? So they're still going to do vacation stuff. 
Um, would I get into vacation rentals right now though at the top of the market cycle? Not necessarily because a lot of folks are going to, you know, not have the money to travel to them, even the booners. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I like to stick at stuff, uh, well, stick to stuff that, that I kind of have, know how they've done already previously in, in severe recessions and downturns. So cell storage, mobile home parks, assisted living facilities are definitely, um, yeah, they're definitely some, some, some assets that we that we're keeping an eye on. All right, cool. Yeah, so uh, we kind of talked a little bit about Cashflow Ninja podcast and your platform. Um, how did you kind of come up with the name? It's a very cool name. It's very brandable. I'm just kind of curious on what's that kind of background story on that. Yeah, so my dad is actually in, uh, a famous, pretty famous martial arts personality. So he travels the world, you know, eight to ten countries a year teaching. Wow. And what I've seen from my dad is is just firsthand a disciplined approach every day to improve your craft and pursue perfection in your craft. And that's something that's kind of missed because – Again, we've been programmed and brainwashed that we go to college, now we're working, and then there's a certain age where we just stop. Mm. And now we just, oh, we retire, which is a completely, it's a completely bogus concept. The idea of retirement is just, I mean, mar marketing folks are great, right? And I'm a marketer myself, but that's, it's, 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 it's just a bogus concept um, because it means to basically expire you know right so yeah, yeah. um but yeah, my, my, my dad is 70 years old he still trains hours every day he still teaches so daily he daily pursues excellent in his craft and i think that's what we the approach that we need to bring to wealth wealth is not a six-month deal it's not a three-month deal it's not you know a year five years ten years it's decades mm -hmm. uh, and doing certain things every day to get a little bit better and trying to get a bit, a bigger future every day. And of course, cash flow is the philosophy that, that, uh, you know, that we talk about, um, and the importance of cash flow. So I kind of merged those two Very cool. of pursuing the, you know, the knowledge and, uh, pers um, trying to perfect your craft daily. Um, and that's why you gotta be a cash flow ninja. Absolutely. So the, uh, as far as your, your podcast, is that, is that a weekly type of show or, or daily? Week, weekly, three times a day, uh, uh, three times a week, uh, my apologies. Um, so we publish three times a week, um, you know, and there's another show that I'm launching soon. It's called Cashflow Investing Secrets. It's a shorter show. It's probably going to be five to 10 minutes just of one concept that I picked up of interviewing over 450 folks. So I haven't really shared that with anyone else. So your listeners are the first. Awesome. To You're gonna, yeah. So tune in once that's ready. Uh, yeah, it should be, what do we know in mid April? It should be in May. Um, yeah, we should, should get it up and ru running. That will just be weekly. You know, we're just going to start with one episode a week, one concept, you know, and then that'll be kind of more random. Whereas I'm learning things and I'm like, Hey, people should know about this. I'll just share it. Right. Absolutely. The, for the many, uh, you say you interviewed over 400 different guests. What would you say? Some of them that kind of stood out and say like, this was a pretty cool interview and you learned a lot from them. Yeah, I just did Grand Cardone. He's a, he, he, that was a good one. Learned a lot from that. Kiyosaki, you know, th there's just been so many great guests. Um, different things um, that I pick up from them. And a lot of folks, um, here's what, what, what some guests have done for me too. They make you think about your thinking, mm -hmm. which is amazing because we never think about our thinking. Um, we think about other people's thinking because that's what schools are. It's mastering other people's thoughts and other people's ideas, mm -hmm. right? Um, so that's been some of the great episodes is when people challenge and say certain, certain things that challenge the way that I thought about something. Mm -hmm. And that makes me evaluate my thinking and think about my thinking. Yeah, that's very cool. It's, uh, it's, and it's also kind of like you get like a whole 30 minutes or 45 minutes to kind of talk with you know someone that's influential in the marketplace that are you know thinking differently that challenge you so it's like kind of like every week you're learning more things and kind of just kind of developing yourself and then you know apply it to your business and your you know your investments absolutely absolutely yeah it's it, it's uh every day um i try to learn something and i mean with this interviews that i do weekly i pick up something new from from these folks so 
it's uh i love doing it i love sharing it it's it's been an honor to do that and to continue to do that so it's uh i love what i do so as far as like the, i know you learn a lot through the interviews and kind of continually educating yourself over the years are there any books that kind of besides from rich dad poor dad that you can recommend to our guests i mean to our audience that they can probably start their journey of kind of elaborating their their mindset or, or education the Creature from Jekyll Island by G, Mr. G. Edward Griffin. Because we get it, think about it. Everything revolves around money, the, our lives, right? The doctors that we see, the schools that our children go to, everything, where we live, what we drive, what we eat, the health care that we can get, everything. But we don't know what money is and where it comes from. So Mr. G. Edward Griffin, that I've been honored to and privileged to have interviewed him twice on my show, he did a phenomenal book that basically lifts the veil of how, how money works and the history of money. So that's a must read for anyone that's interested in generating wealth and building wealth in any asset class. Very nice. Um, as far as your, uh, me and you are both athletes and we have like a, you know, certain routine that's, you know, that's kind of like what you do. Um, what is like your morning routine? Is there anything that you do differently or is it change over the years or what's kind of like some things that you do? Yeah, it's changed a lot. I've got two kids under two, so it's definitely changed. <laughs> so there's a lot of flexibility built into that because of the kids. You never know when they're going to wake up. You know, uh, I, can try to, I can try to beat them up early, which sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. Yeah. So you just have to be very uh, uh, adaptable and adjustable. So where you schedule your workout, I mean, the mornings are the best, obviously, but it doesn't necessarily work out that way. So um, what I've done is I've been a lot more flexible in my schedule. Here are the things, five things that I want to do personally for myself. I want to read. I want to listen to an audio book. Uh, I want to think a little bit. I want to write down what, my, what I'm grateful for and some of my goals. And, and I want to work out. So being flexible throughout the day to get it done and not necessarily because in the past, before pre-children, it was like, yeah, get up, get it done and then start your day, right? Well, I still try to do that, but let's be honest, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a different ball game with two under two. So you gotta be flexible and, and, and adjust, right? Yeah, I, I, the same way I got two, I got one four and one two. And uh, I, I'm I, I sometimes too hard on myself. I was like, I, I gotta do this at a certain time, but it just, it just doesn't work that way. And you know, you have to, you know, you gotta balance because you have other people that you have to worry about it. But you know, the end goal is that you know you're trying to provide a better life for them and and also be there for them and try to be present. So you're trying to want to make it flexible, like you said, to you know to kind of have that balance, but also get their stuff uh, that you want to get done. Yep. Um, and you had just mentioned as far as your your family, like what you're grateful for. Is anything additional that you're kind of that you wake up and say, you know, thank God that you know I have this, and it kind of keeps you going. Yeah, absolutely. My health, my family, my friends, and uh, being able to pursue my uh, my purpose every day. Absolutely. Um, do you do besides from your um, your podcasts and kind of your other educational stuff? Is any uh, meetup groups or local stuff that that you do that people can, if they're in the area, can attend? Yeah. So if you're in southern New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Bucks County, we do a meetup. Uh, every second Thursday of every month in Newtown, it's an investors meetup. We've got a nice core group of folks. So um, yeah, it's been, it's been very, very enjoyable. So I know people can Google your name, find you, but uh, can you just uh, share with us uh, how we get in touch with you? Yeah, cashflowninja.com, uh, your own banking system.com is that free course, but cashflowninja.com, we've got all the information on there and, you know, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Absolutely. And, uh, like I said, just having you on a show, you mentioned about you know interviewing other guests and you learn so much. So just having you just on for a short period of time gave us so much uh, knowledge and, and education. We really appreciate it. And we hopefully to have you back on a show uh, for a second time to keep it uh, even elaborate even more. But uh, MC, it's been a pleasure to interview you and I uh, look forward to talking to you again soon in the future. Thank you so much. This has been a fantastic uh, interview. You did a fantastic job and I really enjoyed our time together. All right. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Wealth Through Real Estate Investing Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review on iTunes or the listening platform of your choice. Also, 
please check us out at DwayneLClark.com, as well as find us on Facebook for more useful content and resources.